Five cents might not seem like much, but when it's five cents for every cow, every day, then it really adds up. New AminoSure XM Precision Release Methionine provides the optimal combination of cost, feed stability, rumen stability, and intestinal release to deliver the best cost per unit of available methionine on the market today. Learn how at balchemanh.com slash findyourx. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Real Science Lecture Series. My name is Scott Sorrell, Director of Global Marketing at Balchem. Today, we, we uh, welcome Dr. Joe McFadden from Cornell University to discuss how we can mitigate intestinal methane emissions quicker to meet today's world needs. Dr. Joe McFadden is an associate professor of dairy cattle biology, Northeast Agribusiness and Feed Alliance faculty fellow, and Cornell Atkinson Sustainability Fellow in the Department of Animal Science at Cornell University. McFadden received his BS degree in animal science from Cornell, a master's degree from the University of Illinois, and a PhD from Virginia Tech. He completed a postdoctoral fellowship at uh, Johns Hopkins Medical and later served as a biochemistry professor at West Virginia University. At Cornell, uh, McFadden is, a leading, is leading the development of the Cornell LIFE. Now, LIFE stands for Livestock um, Innovations for Food Security and Environmental Health. This initiative is meant to establish the infrastructure and international engagement required to identify next generation dietary solutions that enhance milk production efficiency and reduce methane emissions for dairy production. Dr. Joe, the floor is now yours. Thank you for the introduction. I, I hope you can hear me. Um, yes, loud and clear. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to, to also present. Uh, for those that don't know how to reach me, my email is at the bottom at mcfadden at cornell.edu. Uh, I'm also found on social media. It's hopefully obvious to some of you. Um, today's topic is, is really focused on um, sort of what are some of the barriers, some of the, the areas of, of animal science that need to be explored in order to speed up enteric methane mitigation. Uh, this photo here is actually um, in India, it's in Bangalore, India. I had a chance to visit there about two months ago. Uh, this is a, a Goshala, and it's an animal sanctuary, and there's about 1,500 animals, um, most, mostly cows. We probably consider them call cows, but this is where they live the, the, less, the rest of their time. There were some buffaloes, and, and there was a single horse as well, but um, more on this later as we try to think about how to enhance um, efficiency of milk production in countries like India and others in South Asia. So certainly um, there's a lot of topic, a lot of, co uh, a lot of conversation about climate change and animal agriculture. Um, there was I actually received an email this morning um, referencing a, a, a new paper that came out talking about the environmental impact of animal production uh, just in my email inbox. But, you know, one thing that um, has been pretty clear when you read a lot of these reports, uh, specifically this one, this Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, stating that it's virtually certain that irreversible committed change is already underway. And I, I think when we when we hear these kinds of words, uh, you know, it's certainly there's a lot of skeptics that are that are around us. And, and I think that's that's completely fine. Um, it's fine to be skeptical. Uh, but at the same time, we have a really unique opportunity here to enhance the adaptability and resilience of animal agriculture. Um, there's a lot of attention, a lot of focus, and a lot of investment being placed on um, sustainable uh, animal production. And so we really need to leverage um, that attention and we need to, to act on it and uh, use this as a clear opportunity for, for the advancement of our industry. You know, certainly it's not a mystery that cow burps uh, uh, contain methane um, and manure not only emits methane, but there's nitrous oxide. Um, these are certainly two uh, greenhouse gases that are uh, recognized as climate pollutants and an area of concern. You know, cows and other livestock contribute about 40% of methane emissions from um, the ag sector globally. And, um, you know, it's expected that methane emissions are going to increase as cattle population is, is potentially going to increase globally. And that as we think about other sectors that emit greenhouse gases, as they start to reduce their emissions, it's potential that if, if animal ag does not act, um, our contributions are also, as a proportion of total, uh, should increase. 
you know, the, the, um, the, the, there's a popular press article, and the one I was just mentioning was, I just got this in my email, the title was, The Way We Eat Could Add Nearly One Degree of Warming by 2100. Um, and it was a, citing a report in the, uh, in the journal Nature Climate Change. And, and I'll read a sort of a sentence I found. It said, the researchers calculated that methane will account for 75% of food's share of warming by 2030, with carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide accounting for most of the rest. Uh, I haven't had a chance to sort of review that paper yet, but, you know, there's certainly going to be enhanced attention on uh, greenhouse gas emissions from food production, and obviously livestock are going to be a, a key part of that narrative. So um, one comment that we tend to often hear about on social media and in popular press articles is that cows are part of a natural biogenic carbon cycle. You know, I certainly joined this uh, active discussion in, in 2021 with this op-ed, uh, when people were trying to compare our cows as a, as the new coal, um, and I tried to sort of refute that, um, hopefully with some success. Uh, but you know, I, I think it's fine to sort of to to make that clear and, it's, and, and transparent to the consumer. But again, at the same time, um, we, we have there is a sense of urgency, and if if dairy production or beef production can be part of the solution. Um, then I think we need to act on it. And I think the, the farmer has the ability to, to potentially benefit here simultaneously. Um, so this actually, the second one was an op-ed I wrote in time um, just past month. It really summarizes some of the things that I talk about today. So you can always go there as well for, for more information, for more information, excuse me. You know, uh, there's been many others uh, before me that have done some remarkable work. And, and this was um, a report for, uh, for the Global Research Alliance to try to summarize uh, the last several decades of research focused on enteric methane mitigation. And, you know, they really wanted to identify you know, where were the additives that were being being studied and what was the current state of the literature. Um, and, you know, the, the good news is that we've been studying enteric methane mitigation for several decades. Uh, sort of the, I think the bad news is I, you would hope that there would be this sort of holy grail solution that could be work across every production system and 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 every you know type of scenario and that that obviously does not yet exist and may never exist in terms of having a single solution. Um, but that said, they were able to summarize you know things like you've heard about. I'm sure 3NOP, uh, 3NOP uh, works by inhibiting you know the terminal enzyme of methanogenesis. Uh, then you've got asparagopsis and halogenated compounds, which should sort of be put in that category as well. You know, both of these have fairly high um, efficacy. Um, and, you know, there's certainly quite a bit of research around 3NOP as well. There's a, there's a wide um, body of scientific evidence to support its efficacy. Um, with asparagopsis, I mean, it's obviously very effective, but I think there's, there's certainly more research that needs to be done to think about some of the other unintended um, consequences of feeding asparagopsis that I'll, that I'll highlight on here in a moment. You know, I'll talk a little bit about some of these others in, 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 throughout the talk in terms of sort of where we need to expand our knowledge base. Um, but the things when people talk to me, I often hear about things like monensin. You know, monensin is one that, um, you know, it could be in that 5 to 10 percent category in terms of um, inhibitions. And I had a four to shift some BFA production towards propanate. I got a slide or two on that. You know, tannins, tannins get talked about a lot, especially when I'm um, overseas, sort of visiting uh, different groups of people. And, you know, tannins um, really could have a, a potential negative effect on nutrient digestibility. And um, it's, but there's something that's obviously being talked about and uh, they have, but there's relatively low efficacy. Um, but overall, when you look at this, there's, there's just not, a, um, I don't see the game changer quite yet. I don't see... Um, that, that solution that's going to be a, a, a practical solution across all production systems. So as I, I started this process uh, about a couple of years ago, I, I, I had the opportunity to um, build up some infrastructure here at Cornell. And, and in that process, um, you know, I realized that my research program was going to be shifting towards enteric methane. Uh, I never thought that would be the case five years ago, um, but you know, opportunity presents itself. And uh, in that process, I thought, you know, I came at this from a, a fairly unbiased perspective and, and uh, from a fresh start, and, from, and I can look at things sort of, uh, sort of broad strokes. And I wanted to really talk to the people that have defined this area of biology for the last couple of decades. And so uh, I've been in contact with folks at Global Methane Hub, and 
they encouraged me to think about how, hey, go out and talk to these folks and and, and gather a sort of a, a body of knowledge to sort of say, where, where do we need to go next? And I'm certainly not the only one that's done this. There's been many others. And, and hopefully there's a lot of overlap and that hopefully will prioritize our focus. But I want to say a special thanks to these individuals because I met with each one of these for individuals for about an hour uh, and, you know, just asked just very few questions. And it's mainly a listening session for me. And I'm very grateful for the time they spent to, to help me um, learn more about, you know, the direction of the field. Now, the one thing that is pretty obvious, though, when you think about what's the number one thing that we could do to influence methane production and, you know, uh, there's no question that forage type um, uh, and nutrient composition of the diet plays a key role, and we all know this. And I, for those that uh, may be, uh, early, you know, um, early in their career or are still in uh, college, and, and I would like some um, some data to support this, I thought I'd throw a few slides on. You know, this one was looking at um, different levels of corn silage in the diet, um, zero to 100% inclusion as a percent of forage content of the diet. And, you know, the, the, I believe the forage concentrate ratio in this particular diet was 60-40, but things that you would hope to see is an increase in starch content. Obviously, that is enhanced. So you can increase the propionate production. There's that alternative hydrogen sink. And you can see that there's some linear and quadratic effects here for um, methane, uh, specifically when you look at methane as a percentage of gross energy intake. You know, there's certainly a, a, a decrease uh, at the 100% corn silage level. Certainly, shifting things towards propionate and uh, could be beneficial. Um, but you know, when you think about the interactions of the for, um, sort of the base diet or forage of the diet or the forage concentrate ratio of the diet or the starch content of the diet, we need to think about these things in relation to how these feed additives work to inhibit methane. And, and this was a nice study looking at um, 300p feeding at two different um, um, sort of treatment levels. Um, 60 megs or 80 megs uh, per kilogram of dry matter and they had three different diets a grass silage diet a grass silage and corn silage diet or a corn silage diet uh, the grass silage diet was pure the corn si uh, grass silage excuse me but the corn silage diet had just a little bit um grass silage still in it regardless um you know the starch content of diets from, from 10 to 21 percent and ndf stayed constant but here they looked at the efficacy of 300p and they should, were able to show that the diets that had higher starch um, they had a, a sort of greater decrease in methane yield, uh, that's grams per kilogram of dry matter intake. Uh, and accordingly, there was an increase in, in hydrogen pro production um, uh, with that higher corn silage diet. So this is a cl clear example to where differences in the sort of nutrient composition or you know, uh, ingredient composition of the diet had a <clears throat> direct effect on uh, sort of the degree of efficacy for this, this feed additive. And this is something we need to consider. You know, there's a nice meta-analysis that um, Dr. Kabrab is at UC Davis looking at 300p um, feeding. There's 13 or 14 studies in this meta-analysis. And that's the nice thing about 300p, and there's so many studies that are out there, and um, it's really nice for meta-analyses. I've seen people trying to do a meta-analysis with one, one to three studies, and it sort of defeats the point. And, um, you know, this one, it shows that there was you know, a, a conclusive, consistent reduction in methane. I think they actually saw a little bit more than 30% in this meta-analysis. Don't hold me to this, but maybe it's 31, 32%. But, you know, they use this as an approach to sort of investigate how do other components of the diet potentially influence efficacy. And so they broke down each individual sort of dietary component. You can see the components they looked at there in, in panel B, you know, crude fat, NDS, starch, et cetera. Uh, and, you know, a little take home uh, I took from there was that in this particular study, a 1% um, dry matter decrease in dietary NDF content from its mean um, may increase the efficacy of 3NOP in reducing methane production by almost a percentage point. So they were able to show that the NDF content of the diet was, was, uh, uh, was influential in terms of modifying 3NOP efficacy. Uh, they were also so able to see the same for dietary crude fat, um, but this was really at a specific uh, feeding level of, of 3NOP and, 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 and as well as NDF level. I didn't want to put this slide in here, but I get so many questions about this, and there might be a few of you that are engaged. And, and after every seminar, when I, I just briefly mention this, I get a handful of people to actually ask me about this. I'm, I'm quite surprised. Um, but this is something we were working on. It's a little side project. Um, it's, it's, I, I think we, are, we anticipate doing more work uh, in the future in this because we had such great results from this particular study. Uh, but we were looking at um, different um, sort of 
uh, types of forages. So this was wheat um, and barley sprout fodder that we were growing using hydroponics. So we were even thinking about um, sort of the carbon footprint of uh, fodder production as, the, as we start to think about these solutions holistically. But I wanted to bring this up because the hypothesis, and we're still do doing the work here, was that um, including diets, uh, including barley and wheat sprouts as part of a total mix ration, which we did here. We actually chopped this, we, we shredded it, we included it in a TMR. Uh, the diets were isonitrogenous and isoenergetic. Uh, we sort of matched it with um, various concentrates like soybean meal, dextrose, um, corn gluten, and so it's to make sure that these diets were all isoenergetic and isonitrogenous. But the hypothesis was that, that, that these barley and wheat sprout inclusion would enhance nutrient digestibility, which we still need to confirm. But in that process, we were able to show that at least um, energy corrected milk yield was not, was not different. Um, and um, efficiency was actually improved in the animals that had were fed the barley sprouts. And so moving forward, we're trying to think about, um, you know, how does this relate to uh, methane intensity, which would hopefully be reduced here, uh, specifically with the barley sprout feeding. And, and not only doing that, but thinking about how, how forages um, um, could relate to uh, feed additive efficacy. Another thing we're starting to think more about is the energetics of methane. Um, and, you know, there's, this is actually one of the original uh, figures that sort of described how much of gross dietary energy is used is converted to methane. Um, and, you know, the estimates in this particular figure were, I think, 2 to 12 percent of gross energy intake um, is observed as methane. And, um, you know, I think, though, I think I was just reading the most recent NASM and, and somebody was asking me a question. And depending on what document you read, it seems like the, that average holds true around six to seven percent of gross energy intake is lost of methane. And so there's a lot of arguments that, well, if you reduce methane, then we can potentially conserve energy and move energy towards milk or we can move energy towards body weight gain. And, and, I'm, and I'm definitely guilty of that as well. Um, but in order for that to happen, there has to be a substantial reduction in methane energy in order to see it simply because the loss of methane energy is not going to be completely gained and restored as, as uh, net energy for lactation or growth. Um, there's going to be some loss along the way, certainly loss as, uh, as from, from, from um, heat production, um, but also, you know, we, we see some evidence where the hydrogen is not being retained. And so if that's not the case, then um, uh, potentially we're going to not truly benefit. So uh, you're going to hear me say consistently that uh, we're going to have to aim for reductions to greater than 50%, I believe, in order to see uh, sort of performance gains. Um, at the very least, um, in order to see performance gains at a lower level, this could require substantial um, study sizes, uh, population size, to be able to see that, see that uh, benefit. You know, the other thing when we're talking about energetics to sort of ties into all this is, is energy balance as well. And I think there's a lot of um, need to think about how these, um, how nutrient use or nutrient partitioning is, is influenced by um, sort of uh, methane reduction uh, feed additives. And the argument there is, is that, yeah, if you're able to conserve that energy or partition it to other sources beyond, besides methane, well, that's certainly going to be different in a negative energy balance versus positive energy balance state. And, and, and I think 3MP is an example that started to explore this where, you know, they show in, it's in uh, several studies that there can be body weight sort of gain um, tension with 300p feeding in this particular study which uh, as far as i know did not calculate energy balance and uh, i'm actually going to assume that they were in positive energy balance um, they actually saw yes there was a decrease in dry matter intake with 300p feeding but there was an improvement in feed efficiency but at the same time body weight dropped and so i think it's important that we start to think about you know where are where what is explaining any performance gains um, and you can really only do that by looking at sort of the energetics of, of feed utilization um, in order to characterize that because um, it, moving forward, it's could be, it could be imperative. Now, we also need to think about the duration of efficacy um, for these different uh, feed additive approaches. There's, again, a lot known about 300P. Um, Sure, the 300p experts of the world could correct me, but you know, from what I can see, that when you feed 300p, you know, it works really well um, in that um, four to six hour range. You get the maximum reduction in sort of methane emissions, and over the sort of the, the totality of the entire day, you're getting about a 30% reduction. Well, what this requires is a consistent delivery of 300p, um, and I'm, I know there's people working on 
different type of feed additives in terms of um, delivery approaches, like slow release boluses, putting things in water, um, you know, salt blocks, things like that, in order to provide a consistent supply of a feed additive. But you know, in various production systems where there's animals on this planet that might never see a human being for the first year or two of their life, or um, you know, grazing scenarios, rangeland scenarios, uh, well, maybe a little bit more difficult to apply some of a feed additive uh, like 300P. Uh, that does not have a, a delivery method that's suitable for those production systems. And so um, we need to think more about sort of how we're going to administer these feed additives to various production systems. The percent methane reduction is also, I think, unlikely to be a constant. You know, if it were, and we've realized that we've studied enteric methane mitigation for 50 years, maybe it's slightly more, slightly less. Um, if, if it were a constant, then I think we would have we would have solved this problem already. Um, the reality is you're not just dealing with a cow, you're dealing with a cow and her microbiome, okay? And so uh, I think we, many of the people that study sort of rumen digestion would, can agree that it, the rumen is, can be quite resilient and um, specifically the, micro, the microbiome. And, and so there's been some nice work looking at, you know, feeding of, of, of 3 and OP and sort of how long does that affect remain and they're seeing the best reductions for early on uh, week two week four in this particular state uh, case panel a there's two different studies here uh, but that efficacy sort of faded with time and in panel b they were looking at their, you know they're feeding transition cows you know diets that were low or high in starch um, and the um, with or without three and a p which is great to see a transition cow study you know, you know those are that's like so far in between see a feed additive study looking at transition cows. Uh, I think it's pretty key when so many of these feed additives uh, appear to have effects on, uh, on intake sometimes. Um, but in this particular study, they were able to so show that, yes, 3 p worked, uh, but in that lower starch diet, and by week 13, 15, 17 there, almost returned to um, sort of, sort of um, pre-treatment emission, emission levels. Um, so it sort of lost its efficacy uh, over time. And you can even see when the high starch is starting to climb back up. And so what does that look like, you know, mid-lactation or at the end of lactation? And so there is an urgent need to look at um, sort of long-duration feeding trials for 3 p And I know Dr. Hustoff just got a, um, I think, believe it was a USDA grant to, to do just this. And that's really imperative. We really need to know how these things work across a full lactation or even subsequent lactations. You know, we even need to think about this even across the lifespan of an animal. That's a difficult thing to study. Um, one, there's just not many universities that can do that kind of work. And, uh, but then I think this also is a potential place for commercial field trials as well. You know, we need to think about manure greenhouse gas emissions. Um, this is something that has been, for the most part, ignored. Um, you know, something we're really trying hard. I'm, I've been working with our Cornell uh, pro dairy folks uh, that have a sincere interest about thinking about the effects of feed additives on manure emissions, and we're getting some ideas at least um, talked about. And, and, I, and I'd hope that in the, if, if, if things go the way we want them to go in the next year, we'll start doing this ourselves. But you know, this is a particular study, and I'm not a, I, I gave this talk, a similar talk like this in, in Arizona a couple months ago, and I said, I'm not a soil guy. I can't tell you about different soil types. Uh, but they were looking at uh, manure that was coming from cows that were untreated or treated with 3 p And then uh, the, basically in the panel C there, they're looking at three different soil types. And uh, what you would hope is, is that you would hope that basically the, the green and this aqua green bars would be sort of comparable. That would imply that there was not a 3 p effect. Uh, but, you know, in, in this particular soil type, they were able to see a difference, uh, at least the BLC and DBC soil types. Um, read the paper and you'll learn more about it. But, um, so there's a difference there um, in, in, in not only sort of uh, the nitrogen content of, of the manure, but there was also a decrease in uh, nitro, nitrous oxide emissions um, from that manure when placed on different um, soil types. And so I, I think we need to do more about that. Uh, nitrous oxide is also recognized as a kind of pollutant. Um, certainly more potent than methane and, and something we need to be aware of. And, um, so it's not just about enteric. We can't solve one problem and then necessarily create another. And uh, I don't think we have enough information there to really, um, to really define that for any feed additive. Um, so to sort of get around that, that, you know, sort of, can you get a long-term sort of persistent decrease in methane with a feed additive? 
and maybe you can't do that, like you potentially with three NFP, then we need to, we need to think about alternatives. We need to think about um, alternative strategies. Perhaps you know um, co supplementation or replacement strategies are going to be needed. And there's investigators starting to look at this. Uh, this was some European work. It was certainly a high level of canola um, oil that they were feeding in this particular study, but. You know, what's nice about this, this science, science is that you're starting to think about, okay, we know how 3 p inhibits methane, but can we do the things differently to sort of alter the hydrogen sinks in a way to sort of capture that hydrogen um, or work with other types of dietary approaches to reduce methane so they work in synergy to maybe perhaps reduce efficacy even greater, you know, than just one solution by itself. Um, but this replacement or co-supplementation strategy could really ensure the persistence of the effect. And they were able to see that here, at least with canola oil, that um, when you co-supplemented with canola oil, you really maximize the reduction in uh, methane emissions, grams per hour. Um, hydrogen emissions weren't uh, entirely reflective of that. They did increase, obviously, with, with 3 p and with feeding. Um, but, um, you know, Co-combining co these really worked well. Now, what happens at more of a practical feeding level? I think they, they were feeding real high level of canola oil. That, that remains to be determined. But, you know, um, one of the arguments here is that um, unsaturated fat feeding provides an alternative hydrogen sink. Um, I think there's some debate about the extent of that uh, that truly could be captured for, for, for hydrogen use. And is it really going to make a significant impact? But that also talk is, is discussed. Another co-supplementation uh, strategy that was investigated was menensin. So here was a study with um, control um, or plus or minus menensin with plus or minus 3 NOP. And in this particular study, they were able to show a reduction in methane emissions with menensin. And I'll say you don't typically always see that. Everybody loves to say, oh, menensin reduces uh, methane. But when you look at a couple meta-analyses, they actually don't see the effect. And I argue that it probably does exist. Um, I think with many of these studies are highly underpowered in terms of the number of animals per treatment group. And when you're trying to detect the 5% decrease in methane emissions, that can be hard to do when you've only got you know, 10 to 15 cows per treatment. Uh, but in this particular case, they were able to see a, um, a decrease in methane, but they were not able to see um, a further decrease um, um, with uh, 3 NOP feeding um, combined with Munensin. And the thought process here was that, you know, um, that we were going to shift um, VFA formation towards propionate uh, with monensin feeding, and this could be the alternative hydrogen sink. You know, there's work looking at early life interventions to inhibit methanogenesis, and these are, I think, are also poorly defined, but there's a lot of exciting opportunity here, and I know there's at least several groups thinking about this. Um, you know, this was a study, it only had nine cats for treatment, and uh, it is just saying that's what it had. I'm not saying it's good or bad, but uh, in this particular case, um, they were fed 3 and p from birth to three weeks post-weaning. And uh, they were able to show that post-treatment, so three weeks post-weaning, they, they took the 3 and p away, they were able to maintain that reduction in methane um, grams per day um, for several weeks after. And, and that's quite impressive. Um, and so things that we can do early on in life, especially if there are things that you can do just for a very short period of time that have a long-term benefit, obviously that is a holy grail uh, worth chasing because that would certainly work for various production systems where you're not able to interact with the animal on a consistent basis. You know, I also argue that we need to think more about mode of action um, for these various um, feed additives. Uh, we need to know how things work. Um, it's important. Um, and some people um, may disagree, but um, from my standpoint, I need to know how something works if I'm going to make a recommendation. Um, you know, essential oils, um, people have been talking a lot about aglin ruminant, I, at, least, at least with me they talked about it. Um, aglin ruminant is probably the most studied in my opinion. Um, they have dozens of studies um, that have looked at uh, this blend of essential oils. Um, they have been shown to consistently increase um, energy corrected milk yield and, and feed efficiency. It does take some ramp up time from, from my perspective in order to see this benefit. Um, and that it can reduce methane production or intensity, and that's approximately 10%. I think there's different different numbers I've seen, 7%, 11%, but about 10% reduction. Uh, no apparent change in dry matter intake, no apparent change in milk composition. And, yeah, and I'm, I'm under the impression they're currently paying carbon credits to dairies. Um, that, that's um, quite interesting. But in this particular case, um, yeah, you know, they're able to see that effect on methane reduction 
about five, six, seven, eight weeks after treatment. So it does take some ramp up time. And, and there's a lot of questions about how this works. Um, you know, is it is it influencing with antigen populations, shifting rumen fermentation or nutrient digestibility? I mean, there's there's been attempts to look at this, but there's no sort of conclusive evidence uh, time and time again. And so I think with time, we'll figure this out. There's no question about that. But I think we need to know how things work, especially when we're going to start thinking about, you know, co-supplementation or replacement strategies, because uh, in order to maximize, um, to get beyond that 50 percent. And I think solutions like essential oils are, are part of the solution because I don't think um, uh, it's going to be clear, uh, it's going to be easy to get beyond 50% with, with a single solution in every production system. You know, another one I, I've been thinking about and, um, and, and others will have, have as well is that, you know, the process form of the additive may impact efficacy. And so, I just did uh, some reading, looking at cashew nut shell liquid, and uh, you know this is a good example where you have a heated form versus a cold pressed form that can uh, influence the anacardic acid and cardinal profiles. So these sort of phytochemicals um, that you know, some may reduce methane quite well, and others may be not. And so, um, you know, the technical cashew nut shell, technical grade cashew nut shell liquid is actually the heated version that has far less anacardic acid. Now. And so it's, but they did, were able to see a, a reduction here in uh, at least a tendency for uh, a methane on the gram per kilogram of dry matter intake basis on the yield basis. Uh, but this could potentially look superior for the cold pressed version. So I think, I think this is something we need to think about uh, is um, how, um, you know, when you have an active ingredient that inhibits methane within a, this plant-based product, um, how does processing influence its efficacy? You know, there's a lot of work to use in vitro testing um, to look at a lot of these plant-based compounds. Um, I like to think that um, yeah, people are going to disagree with me on this probably, but it's fine. Um, in my opinion, they have limited utility. Uh, in vitro testing does, um, not these compounds, but the in vitro testing approach. Um, but typically, when you when we see these compounds in the scientific literature, most of the time it's in vitro testing. And I think in vitro testing has a time and a place. And, and certainly at the onset of, of product development, uh, yeah, it's a go-to to get some quick information. And, but to, more often than not, you might see profound reductions in methane reduction in vitro inside of the flask. But when you put it in the cow, you don't see anything at all. So I think that's the, the only thing that uh, we need to be aware of. But, you know, garlic and flavonoid containing citrus extract, oregano, green tea extract. I mean, these are all things that might fit also into that essential oil category in terms of having sort of low efficacy, <clears throat> actually I say low efficacy, a low degree of methane reducing efficacy. Um, but in part of the solution, but there's just so little evidence to support um, um, their widespread adoption just yet, but more, more research is needed. In vivo. You know, I can't not not talk about Tom seaweed. Um, certainly, it's a potent methane inhibitor. Um, you know, there's studies like this one and many others that not many, but you know, a dozen or so that have shown consistent reductions that um, with uh, seaweed feeding. And you know, there's work thinking about even pure bromoform um, and other um, halogenated compounds. Um, but um, you know, in this one though, they're able to see a consistent reduction in dry matter intake. Um, and I think this has been observed in several studies. Um, you can sometimes see improvements in feed efficiency. But, you know, looking at these studies, um, you know, reductions in feed intake and a fresh cow may be a little bit more concerning. And so more of those kinds of studies are, are going to be particularly needed. Um, there is the concern um, as well that these, this, this approach could potentially have some influence on animal health. And, and I think this is, you know, if, if people where you know, some people ask me, do you think seaweed is a solution? I say, I say, absolutely, I think it's a solution. I think you just need more science to figure out the appropriate dose in order to um, minimize some of these adverse consequences. Um, but, and this was one that was brought up that was looking at the rumen health, the epithelium, the rumen epithelium and its health. And so they actually uh, uh, performed some necropsies on uh, these, um, these animals that were fed seaweed. And, and granted, this could have been due to the high, high feeding level, but they're able to observe some signs of necrosis and inflammation of the rumen epithelium. And, and to be honest with you, there's very few studies that have gone to this far length to look at the effects of a, of a feed additive that reduces enteric methane on, 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 on uh, animal health. So more of that is needed for sure. Also with seaweed, they've shown that, you know, bromoform has a, a, a short stability, uh, short shelf life. 
Um, this is, I think, I, I credit um, Dr. Histoff for, for his excellent science at Penn State because in this particular study, I believe this was a four by four Latin square design. In the first two periods, they showed wonderful efficacy and this high asparagopsis taxiformis treatment level in terms of reducing methane yield. But in period three and four, they didn't see that. And they went back and did a side experiment to look at sort of the stability of the bromoform and they showed that after 120 days of storage, it, it basically um, um, was no longer uh, viable. And so th that kind of uh, questioning is needed when we think about um, uh, feed additives for sure. You know, we also think about the nutrient composition of meat and milk that can't be ignored as well. And, you know, it looks pretty positive in terms of meat composition. I haven't seen too much data showing any sort of um, um, uh, bromoform or bromide accumulation in um, uh, meat, but you do see that in milk, which I showed in two prior slides. There was an increase in bromoform content. I just reviewed actually the most recent study this morning, and I still saw the same thing, more bromide in milk. Um, iodine um, also um, will accumulate uh, in milk as well. Arsenic, maybe only at really high feeding levels, is probably not so, so, such a concern. But depending on how the seaweed is sourced, it's certainly going to influence the ash content uh, of that seaweed. And, um, and so I know there's a lot of attention focus on that. Um, and uh, I only bring this to your attention because I had somebody just this morning come to my office. Um, he was just visiting Cornell and um, he was thinking about cultivating seaweed um, off of Long Island. Obviously not Asparagopsis taxiformis, but um, we were talking about the ash content um, and how, how it could potentially be variable. Uh, we also need to think about how these additives um, influence having a, the manufacturing of the additive has an environmental impact. Um, you know, seaweed is one of those cases where, you know, maybe you're going to have to cultivate this in, in various uh, inoculum tanks. And, and not knowing much about, you know, seaweed manufacturing, I did find this one particular article, and I thought the negative environmental impact would have been the drying down of the seaweed. Obviously, you got to dry it down to uh, reduce, you know, the negative environmental impact of drying it down and transporting it everywhere. That, that's not going to be potentially a good thing. But it was actually the rock salt um, that was the, had the largest sort of um, um, negative environmental impact in terms of carbon footprint, uh, which was required for the inoculum tank. Um, they can get around this if they mine the salt or source the salt from sea, but um, they, they argued that most of it would be coming from, from rock salt. And um, that was something we need to be made aware of because Again, we don't want to reduce enteric methane, but increase the carbon footprint of, a, of, a, of another um, source. Uh, I think we can also benefit here from having um, various method standards. And there's many groups working on this, Global Research Alliance, um, UC Davis. Uh, we also received some funding from the Environmental Defense Fund uh, to work on this as well. Um, and this, there, there's going to be many different definitions for this, but you know, for, for instance, in chamber trials, you know, um, chamber trials, uh, it's very important to be reporting um, sort of the efficiency of the system, you know, performing gas recoveries, whether using chambers or, or green feed system like you see there on the right. Obviously, there are methods out there to use green feed. Um, I've seen um, some protocols that sort of say, hey, let's go ahead and use the established protocol um, um, for using green feed that was developed at Penn State. And I'm like, okay, let's go try to do it. Well, that protocol was for a 2x milking regimen, not a 3x feeding, uh, milking regimen, and I can't really adopt to that. And I think when we start to think about how do you measure methane emissions on farm, and maybe we want to use some of these kinds of technologies, uh, well, we have to think that every herd is going to be managed slightly different, and maybe we can't adhere to those protocols. And so we have to, we have to really um, scrutinize that. Another thing we're trying to think about here is you know, how to validate um, validate technologies. And so um, um, there are different types of, for instance, approaches to measure methane. And um, how are those compared? How are they, what are they validated against? Um, I could get into a long probably debate about that, um, but it has a lot of merit because right now, there, at least in the United States, there's very few sort of kind of chamber trial research studies going on that provide absolute quantitation. But um, Greenfeed has, um, advantages and disadvantages. I think this is probably requires more conversation. Uh, and I'll finish by saying uh, in terms of um, sort of methods is that, you know, for those that are considering to do research in, a, in an academic research setting, and, and I return it back a budget uh, showing you, oh, it's going to require 20 to 30 animals per, per treatment group. Um, 
I guess don't laugh at me. Um, try to take me serious because uh, detecting a 5% reduction in methane requires high count numbers. And this is just showing you the Monensen data that um, this, they're, they were unable to see a sort of a pattern here in terms of methane reduction, but um, this could be argued of, that many of these studies had small population sizes. And so I know things like, for example, there, I saw another group looking at um, plant-based extracts like essential oils, and they were estimating like 30 cows per treatment group are going to be needed to see uh, the methane-reducing effect. Um, so where are we at? And, um, and there was a the Global Research Alliance performed a survey uh, of various um, um, farmers and, and feed additive developers. And I wanted to talk about this because, um, you know, and we're really focused on this in developed countries. There's no question about this. There's a lot of energy. There's a lot of investment. Um, and co companies are acting. Uh, they're moving on it. Uh, but in this particular su study where they asked what type of countries the company is currently targeting, it was clear that 80 percent, 85 percent were in were focused on developed countries and, and only a, a fraction were focused on developing countries. Um, and then when we think about the type of system, yeah, there was a lot of confinement management, dairy and feedlot scenarios, but not really very little effort focused on grazing. Um, that's going to be really important uh, moving forward. And so I think, though, this, this, this conversation about how do you develop a feed additive for developing countries, um, that, that, that's, that's a conversation that's worth having. But I think it's, it's also something that we need to put things in perspective. Um, in developing countries emerging, or countries with emerging economies, um, you know, development, applying a feed additive is, is maybe easier said than done. Uh, and maybe we need to be focused on more so on enhancing efficiency of those countries, um, efficiency of production. And, and you've all seen this figure before. Um, hopefully many of you have. But this looks at um, sort of um, the dilution of maintenance effect, where increased milk production per cow, then reduce the maintenance requ uh, requirements percentage of total. And this, in, this is the definition of enhanced efficiency. And by doing so, you use, use less land, water, um, and you, the cows produce less methane per unit of milk. Well, when you look at the efficiencies of energy corrected milk production in terms of CO2 equivalents from the U.S. Holstein cow, and I chose a country here, India, but this could be applied for any country, most likely in South Asia or, or in Africa. Um, it, it's noticeably greater. Uh, it could be on the order of about 12-fold greater in terms of methane um, or CO2 equivalents um, being emitted um, per unit of energy corrected milk. And so there's a lot of opportunity here to enhance efficiency of these various production systems. And India has a lot of, um, a lot of merit. And I want to just use this as a, as a, as a case study here because it's something I'm personally interested in and where my research program is developing. Um, but, you know, in India has 300 million plus cattle and buffalo. Um, and in terms of, uh, you know, the total ruminant population of the earth is certainly the, the epicenter um, of ruminants. And um, it deserves to be um, uh, considered. And I think that 300 million is probably an underestimate, in my opinion. But this is the estimate that, um, they're, that I'm being provided. And you look at total emissions by region and their uh, profile of various commodities, obviously South Asia um, and Latin America play a key role here. But focusing on South Asia, you can see that, um, you know, they have over world, more than 50% of the buffalo in the world. Um, and so, um, again, has a lot of merit. And you can't, if you don't believe me, here's another slide just looking at um, sort of methane emissions. And you can see it in terms of... Um, um, India. Now, obviously, this is not just accounting for, for ruminants, um, enteric methane emission, but um, it, it, is a, it is a high priority country. So I had a chance to visit India, uh, and I noticed three various production systems. These are some of the videos, uh, photos I took. Um, the one on the left, the two images on the left, top and bottom, um, this was a 300 cow farm, very comparable to what I would expect um, in the United States, with the exception of how they're processing and preparing their TMR. But um, that being said, this was some sorted sorghum silage, um, sorghum that was being chopped. Um, they did have sorghum silage in the bunk, but um, you know they had sensors. You know there were a lot of crossbreds. There's one photo down there at the bottom. Um, you know 3x milking, um, um, milk replacer. You know uh, very contemporary, in my opinion. Um, but when I talked to the um, variety of folks that I had the privilege of speaking with in India, uh, there's going to be some small growth in this sector, but they don't believe that this is going to dominate future growth of the dairy production. You know, in reality, they have 75 million smallholder dairy farmers that are managing the near totality of those 300 million um, cows and buffalo. You know, 75 million, okay, 75 million 
smallholder farmers. That's incredible. Okay, United States, we're talking like 30, 40,000 dairy farmers. Okay, so um, that is an incredible feat in order to try to enhance efficiency across that wide of a range of farmers. Um, the production system number two that I observed was the Goshalas, and that's the, the photo I started the seminar with. Uh, these are animal sanctuaries where, where animals go. And so in their mind, where there's calls to reduce the ruminant populations, um, th this, is, this is easier said than done in India. Um, they're, they're not, they're, you cannot just go ahead and call a, a cow just because she's not making milk. She ends up in this, these sanctuaries. Uh, and their plant of nutrition is real low. So in terms of their efficiency, obviously they are making some milk in this one particular um, sanctuary they were, but it's, it's going to be incredibly low. Um, and then the other system, which is the one I put on the right, which is like, I don't know what the name of the system is. This is just uh, ruminants everywhere system. Um, it, these two cows I saw laying in the street, this is in Bangalore, and I think I came back about 36, 48 hours later, and I was pretty convinced they were still laying in the same spot. Um, but, you know, how do you reach these animals? Some of these animals do have owners, others do not, and um, that's a potential concern because then you don't know how to um, target that population with enteric methane mitigation strategies. I did have a chance to visit a, a smallholder farm. I was uh, thankful for this owner in the top right hand corner. They were actually uh, capturing uh, the biogas uh, with these fermenters, uh, which was pretty cool to see. Uh, he was using it for, for fuel, which created a sort of a, a cleaner uh, cooking environment uh, for his family. Um, and uh, they're actually using the slurry, which was underneath this biogas fermenter, shipping it to local slurry plants to create fertilizer, which represented an extra source of income for the farmer. Um, what I was pretty compelled with is that, you know, every evening, you know, all of these farmers come together at collection sites to get paid for their milk. And there's also milk testing that's being done. Um, there's incredible efforts in India to register every farmer. And so no matter if you had one animal or five animals, every farmer would hopefully be registered. So you'd have all their animals registered. You'd have their production system. You'd have their milk test all, all, all virtually accessible, which is pretty incredible to do that at that wide of a scale. And, uh, you know, they also have to contend with all the monkeys. I, I was on this, this individual, uh, in terms of hectares, I think maybe it was like six, six hectares or something. It was a very small sort of plot of land, but he probably had like 20 monkeys running all over the place. Um, so you think we have our challenges, um, try to deal with 20 monkeys. Um, there's a lot of emphasis on ethno-veterinary treatment. Um, and so, and, and the science behind this, I'm not fully aware of, uh, of the science, but I'm, I'm looking forward to learning. Um, and seeing what kind of opportunities there are, but um, you also need to think about concurrently improving animal health here as a way to um, improve efficiency. And so uh, we have an opportunity to work um, with um, support from the Environmental Defense Fund. And so I can never, if you asked me a few years ago if I were going to have studies in India, I would have said no, um, but now we do. Uh, we're, we're gearing up where we have a post acquisition now, and our first study will be um, this starting in this fall. And we're going to be working with the National Dairy Development Board of India, um, which is sort of the governing authority of, of the dairy production system throughout India. Um, we're going to work in there um, through a variety of approaches to build a feed library for Gujarat, uh, which would be Western India. Uh, the goal is to work about in a, in a village with maybe 200, 300 farmers. We want to go out there and survey their behavior. We want to better understand the types of feeds they're using. We want to sample feeds and start to understand uh, sort of the nutrient profile of those feeds and hopefully enhance the utility of ration balancing um, in this region of India. And we, we certainly hope to expand those efforts as well. And, and it looks like that will be the case across India, but time will tell. Um, very, and we're, we're certainly going to add enteric methane mitigation sort of, um, sort of component to this as we start to um, better quantify methane emissions in this, in this uh, farm systems. Uh, I'll finish by saying that Cornell Life, um, we're really ramping up our efforts. And so a lot of my energy started at the, the development of our respiration chamber system. Construction starts next month, so I've been told. I'm very hopeful. Uh, thanks to $2 million in support from New York State, New York Ag and Markets, Cargill, and Belchem Corporation to help us support this infrastructure. Very grateful for that support. Um, and we really need it. Uh, the this system will be for to measure total gas exchange. Uh, not just methane, hydrogen, CO2, but ammonia, nitrous oxide, nitric dioxide, and also, also oxygen consumption allow us better to define the energetics of feed utilization. Also, the, these chambers can go from um, just slightly below freezing to 105 degrees Fahrenheit. So 
really hot. Um, and study feed and water intake in real time. Very, very excited about this opportunity. We're acquiring, acquiring more green feed units um, with time here. Uh, we're ramping up our ability to study individual feed intake on hopefully 190 cows at once um, and building up the necessary staff support and hopefully faculty hires. Uh, things look promising in that area as well, all focused on enteric methane mitigation. I'd like to uh, thank my, my lab for a lot of their efforts on this. Um, for those that may be a student out there, um, there are a lot, some of these positions have been filled since I last updated this. Um, we were likely to still have one graduate student position, and I know I at least have one postdoc position still available. Um, two, actually. One is currently being recruited for the India project, and one uh, that will focus more on um, um, enteric methane mitigation studies here at Cornell. Uh, transparency is key, um, and you know these are the folks that support me and, and all the efforts that we do here. Um, and I'll leave that there and move to questions. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. McFadden. Uh, before we get started answering questions, we'd like to share a brief video, and then we'll be right back to answer the questions submitted during today's presentation. With today's low milk prices and rising feed protein costs, now is the time to turn up the dial on rumen efficiency. NitroSure Precision Release Nitrogen is designed to help stabilize rumen ammonia pools by synchronizing carbohydrate and nitrogen availability to the microflora. Providing a consistent supply of ammonia is proven to increase rumen microbial populations, improve fiber and dry matter digestibility, and stimulate microbial protein yield, all leading to greater efficiencies in forage utilization and higher milk and milk component production. Maximize rumen microflora with NitroSure to turn up rumen efficiency and productivity. All right, we've got several questions coming in. Uh, as a reminder, you can still submit questions through the Q&A tab at the top of your screen. Dr. McFadden, our, our first question comes in from Hector. What do you think about reducing methane emissions by a certain percentage by using linear programming? Um, sorry, you sort of broke up there. Yeah, I uh, Sorry, um, what do you think about reducing methane emissions by a certain percentage using linear programming? Linear programming? Um, yeah, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to. Uh, I think um, in terms of, I'm not sure if this is going to answer your question or not, but in terms of um, sort of, if you're referring to sort of breeding opportunities, is that what the question is referring to? I'm not really sure. Um, you know, in terms of that one, um, you know, there is... Ration some, formulation, Joe. Ration formulation. Um, in terms of ration formulation, um, you can reduce methane intensity, absolutely. I mean, in terms of what we're doing already in the, in the United States, um, I think we're, we're, we're pretty much where, where our capabilities are at. Um, I think the ability to enhance um, producer income and milk production through use of ration balancing in countries like in South Asia, um, that is in the order of 10 to 20 percent of what the estimates are um, to enhance, um, sort of reduce methane on that order, about 10 to 20 percent by applying ration balancing in those countries. Obviously, in those countries, um, there's there's a potential uh, concern there is that obviously we get, we're dealing with poor genetic merit for milk production. Um, and um, the other one is the, uh, you know, management and have poor health. Um, obviously, there's not a lot of, there's efforts to increase crossbreeding efforts and that, that ration formulation could have better benefit in various crossbred animals than indigenous cows. But um, yeah, there, there, there appears to be substantial effort, effort to support its use. All right, next question is from Rand. Can you be more specific about the disadvantage of using the Tilly and Terry 4 method for estimating a CH4 reduction using different additives? Um, you said in Terry, I'm not sure if I could be able to answer that question. The, the, the Tilly and Terry 4 method. Tilly and Terry 4. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I have not, I, I've probably, yeah, I can't comment on that right now. 
All right, very well. Uh, Jair is asking, could rotational, uh, rotation of strategies be a solution for sustained enteric methane mitigation by avoiding uh, microbe adaption? And then what are your thoughts about vaccines and selective breeding as strategies to reduce enteric methane? Yeah, the vaccines one is something that I've read on, I read about a little bit. Um, it seems as though in terms of the, the work coming out of New Zealand, the, uh, it looks very promising in terms of the work they've done in sheep. Um, it's going to take some effort to scale up those efforts, uh, at least in cattle, they estimate maybe in the next decade. Uh, in terms of the value of, of vaccines to reduce methane, it appears to be about 30% from some of the numbers that I've seen. Um, so yeah, there, there's obviously a lot of, a lot of merit and a lot of um, opportunity there. The, um, the other one was, uh, the other question I forget what you were saying, oh, replacement strategies in terms of the microbiome. Um, I think abs absolutely, I think that's um, has a, a lot of potential benefit. I haven't seen, I'm trying to think if I can recall any studies that have done that. I think I've seen one study that showed some promise, but I don't think there's been the work there to look at it. But, um, you know, it's not just about the bacteria. We also think about the protozoa as well. Um, so uh, I don't think, we think we tend to think specifically on the bacteria and potentially the studies that I've seen, but the protozoa deserves a lot of attention as well. All right, next question comes in from Gabriella. This is a long one and potentially a collaboration opportunity. From a, uh, for a tropical developing country like Costa Rica, where we're just starting research on this topic and production is based on a grazing system, where would you start? Oh. At the uh, official government institute that investigates uh, this in, agri in agriculture, we are starting on the methane issue. We have been working on nitrous oxide emissions in livestock systems for several years, but until now, we're going to start on methane emissions for animals. What equipment for methane measurements do you consider essential? Oh. Yeah, lot, lots of that question. Uh -huh. lots, lots, lots of that. <laughs> I'll, say, I'll say that, um, you know, there's some work looking at, um, well, I'm trying to think of the, my approach to the answer here. Like, Let's just let's just use the example of, of the green feed unit, right? So, um, I would argue that there's some studies out there where you take a unit like green feed to measure methane, and, and some people argue that it's been validated to a gold standard. Which, in my opinion, the gold standard would be a respiration chamber that measures total gas emissions. Well, any type of new monitoring equipment that you take on, whether there's just talks about. Uh, you know, measuring emissions in a milking parlor, there's measure uh, using lasers, um, you have to validate it to some sort of standard. And so I think there's some validity to exploring those. And I know in India, I've had conversations with, with NDDB folks, National Dairy Development Board, and they're thinking about lasers too, because it provides a little cost, low cost means to measure methane emissions. And they want to validate that to um, different, you know, more, sort of more um, validated instrumentation like green feed. Um, but you have to do those validation studies in the same sort of study. And that's, I think, was one of my criticisms with the green feed validation is that the way those studies were validated, the way you can validate any methane monitoring tool is um, they, they would take the emissions that they got from a single study using green feed and then compare that to the emissions that were calculated from ch um, chamber trials. And I argue that you've got two very different um, sort of experimental conditions there. And so you're not going to have um, a scenario where those two are necessarily comparable. And so we need to validate new technologies that monitor methane in single, single studies, single experimental conditions at the same time. So that's my first comment. In terms of the grazing scenario, you know, we, you know, it's unfortunate that Cornell does not have any grazing research uh, at Cornell in terms of uh, at our Cornell Dairy Research Center. I actually walked out back and I looked out at the pasture and I was like, wow, I wonder if I could, what I could do here. Because I see there's a huge demand for sure. And I actually talked to one of our plant breeders and the plant breeders, and she was, we were talking about tannins, but I think there's other opportunities to think about um, plant breeding to sort of include some of these methane reducing compounds in the plant, in the forage. And so I think there's opportunity there, there as well um, that's worth exploring. All right, next question comes in from Paula, um, and she's asking of all the challenges you described today, what do you see as priority one and how do we address it? Um, duration, long duration feeding trials is priority number one. Um, there's no question about that in my opinion. Um, I think 
I think there's people that are working on that. Uh, it's it's going to be tough to do because if I went out to my farm right now and I said, I want to take 100 cows and I want to go study them for a year. Um, yeah, I get it done. But, um, you know, maybe maybe that's going to create some some other issues for other other PIs. But that's 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 not my problem. Um, but longer duration feeding trials are really needed because there's some evidence that after a few weeks or eight weeks that these effects take time or they take time to actually develop the effect. Like it doesn't happen immediately on day one, it takes several weeks. So it works both directions. So, and not only just on methane, but also on animal health and so, and, and performance, but more importantly, I think animal health. Um, reason why I say that is that there's gonna be a lot of scrutiny, at least, at least in the United States, um, on any technology that we apply. And I was actually sort of surprised by all this positive buzz regarding seaweed um, and it has a lot of merit the buzz the, the, but at the same time I'm just slightly concerned because um, what happens when consumers identify that you know that you, there's increases in bromide content in milk or um, they realize that a potential feed additive could be a potential carcinogen like these things that we want the consumer to be fully aware of that now so the reason why we not 10 years from now. Otherwise, we're not, we're going to be no further ahead than we are now. Um, so long duration feeding trials, priority number one. You know, a good follow-up question comes in from Lil I, uh, and he's asking, what do you think is the best uh, current commercial feed additive for lowering methane emissions? <laughs> you put me on the spot. Uh, I try to remain unbiased and just present. Yeah, I understand. Um, you know, I will say that I think there's enough evidence. I know there, that there's some FDA approval that needs to happen with 3MLP. Um, but, you know, I, I think that's going to come eventually. Um, and I think that has um, strong merit. Um, and uh, and I'm, I'm very much supportive of it. I would not say the same for any kind of seaweed just yet. Um, and in terms of something else that might be um, um, more sort of beneficial at reducing methane, but maybe on a, on a lower lower efficacy. Um, I think these essential oils have, have some merit. Um, I don't think this robust decreases by any means, but um, again, I, I have some faith and some merit in that technology too. All right. Uh, next question comes in from Chandra. I am curious about the work looking at barley sprouts. I can understand that it would be uh, like would likely result in lower methane as it is not really a fiber source at this stage. Also, what about the other environmental factors of this type of uh, feed uh, with high water inputs? Yeah. And it has a negative impact on dry yeah. matter intake. Yeah. No, and also, I, you know, I thought this was a project. I told you I was going to get questions on this because it's something that I took out of opportunity to acquire a previous student to bring back to my lab. And I said, let's just do it. And we, we, we literally had two um, office buildings that we were that we, we installed at our dairy and we were we were growing this fodder sort of the old school hydroponic approach and uh, I'll say that the study was terminated because there was so much water going on in the floor <laughs> that uh, the water the floors were starting to sink in um, and so then we regrouped and we started growing it out of a shipping container and I learned so much that I never thought I would learn about seed density or slope um, so water patterns, uh, we started working with various blends of the seed, wheat and barley, to get di different nutrient profiles. Um, you know, they're, they're nutrient dense. You know, you look at on a dry matter basis, they're nutrient dense, starch, protein, looks fairly, fairly good. Um, and we were worried about the, the intake um, issue um, and, and because we thought, yeah, for sure, water intake is going to go up. We did install water meters on <coughs> um, about half of the animals and numerically, um, obviously, animals that had sprouts did consume more water. Um, I'm sorry, excuse me, they consumed less water um, simply because they were consuming more water uh, from the sprouts. And intake did, um, did uh, was impacted. Uh, there was a decrease in, in dry matter intake, and but efficiency was improved. Um, so we have not yet done the estimates there on the sort of the environmental impact. We've started to look at things like the electrical output, um, water demand of growing the units. Um, we are doing that. We're working with um, uh, other colleagues in my department to help us model that. And uh, on the methane side, I certainly hope in the future we can actually measure emissions um, um, from that, from the same kind of approach. But 
from now it looked pretty good. Yeah, the performance looked really good. And the components, everything looked pretty much on par. Nothing really changed too much uh, as compared to the conventional TMR without sprouts. Very well. Um, we've gone past the top of the hour. Uh, do you have time for a couple more questions, Joe? Uh, let's go two because I do have a I have another meeting I got to go to unfortunately. Got it. All right. Uh, let's go with a question from Yanting. Uh, what's your opinion why there's no correlation between milk feed efficiency and milk production and methane production as seen in recent meta analysis? Um, no correlation between feed efficiency and methane intensity. Um, I'd like to be made aware of that if that's the case. I guess I'd be under the opposite sort of um, perspective. So maybe the, this individual could send me an email at fed at Cornell ADU. Sounds good. And then we'll end with this question. In the big scheme of things, how much impact will the methane mitigating additives and strategies you discussed mm -hmm. have on to total carbon emissions? Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, global. Uh, yeah. I think we're optimistic to be frank. Um, that it could have a substantial impact um, globally um, simply because I don't know how these technologies are going to be applied um, in the bulk of the countries that have most of the ruminants on the planet. So guess I'm not overly optimistic to be frank. Um, but um, you know, realizing that methane, um, that agriculture and livestock contribute a substantial proportion of total global methane emissions, I am hopeful that um, the technologies can be developed to work in various production systems and thereby have and then reduce total global methane emissions. Can we reach the 30 percent by 2030? I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. I think that's I would I basically probably say right now that's not going to happen. Um, but we got to try. Right. And so and hopefully the combination of approaches will get there. I don't think it's going to be a single solution. We're not going to get to that 30 percent. All right, very well. Uh, thank you, Joe. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for attending today's webinar. If you have additional questions, please submit them to anh.marketing at balchem.com. The Real Science Lecture Series of webinars continues on April 4th with Evine Van Rysdijk from uh, Ned, Ned Dapp uh, Livestock Management. She joins us to share her presentation titled Cow Monitoring Technology, revealing her secrets to unlo uh, unlock her true potential. Visit balchem.com slash real science for more details and to register for all future webinars. Balchem's podcast series continues to offer a deeper dive into our webinar topics. Log on to your favorite podcast platform and search for Real Science Exchange or visit balchem.com slash podcast. If you want a really cool Real Science Exchange t-shirt, just subscribe to the Real Science Exchange and send us a screenshot along with your address and shirt size to anh.marketing at balchem.com. On behalf of Balchem and Dr. McFadden, thank you for joining us today.